Talk Show. Recorded live. Hello, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But the Truth. It's January 1st, 2015. I'm going to start out with the headlines on Yahoo.com. Headline number one Pope and New Year Call for Peace teases noisy Mexicans. Uh, Pope Francis ushers in 2015 in typically unpredictable style on Thursday, launching an appeal for an end to war before light-heartedly teasing the many Mexicans in the crowd. And that's uh, from AFP. And we're going to scroll down and see... Uh, uh, it looks like Article 8. No, uh, Pope Francis drives a wedge between Catholic Church GOP. This is the Hill. Hours after President Obama announced moves to ease trade and travel restrictions to Cuba, Senator Marco Rubio, excuse me, Marcos Rubio, Republican of Florida, a practicing Catholic. And you go on further to read about that. But that should be enough information right there to make you think. Uh, Looks like two more articles down. Archdiocese, experimental drug, not effective in fighting cardinals' cancer. Uh, This is Chicago Tribune, which you'll hear an awful lot about the Roman Catholic Church from. Um, uh, Cardinal Francis George has stopped taking the experimental drug because it has not been effective in his cancer treatment. And and about four more articles down. Report Pope action putting Catholic Catholic Church against GOP. So they're still talking about this Cuba thing that's going on. A few more articles down. A little off topic, but relative to our times. Transgender teen suicide note. My death needs to be mean means needs to mean something. That's from uh, Yahoo News. So yeah, they're pushing that stuff. And then a couple more articles down. It is nearly six million people travel to the Vatican to see Pope Francis in two thousand fourteen. Huffington Post. So once again, we see here in the top headlines, one particular organization keeps on uh, popping up and uh, should make one start to wonder why that is. Now, today we have a very special show. Uh, We've titled it Exposing the Futuristic Deception of Daniel's 70th Week uh, with Tom Fress. And uh, we have... uh, Tom with us, and we also have York from Juggler 66. So our hope is that this teaching will be clear, concise, straight to the point. The first time that I heard of this teaching myself was about a year ago, from Tom actually, from another show. And one thing that I noticed, that after three hours of him trying to explain it, uh that there's still uh, an awful lot of rude interruptions, uh, individuals interjecting their own opinions, and nobody was really listening except for one person in particular on that show. And I'm not tooting my horn, but for some reason God motivated me to listen, and uh, I'm still listening. So with that, Tom, I'd like to welcome you aboard, and Jorg as well. Tom, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Good afternoon to you, Michael, and Yurt Glissman. Nice to be aboard in such fine company. And it's such an important, uh, all-important subject that we're about to discuss. So with that, Tom, uh, I'm just going to let you start the show. I mean, this is something that um, I have a lot of respect towards you as far as your understanding goes of this topic. You have certainly have... Um, Help me to understand the truth about Daniel's 70th week and about 
Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. So I'm going to just let you lead the show because you know better than anybody. So. Okay. Well, that's a tall order. Um, I'll do the best I can with what God's given me. Okay. The, one of the most important subjects for our time is the prophecy given in Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 23 and continuing to the end of the chapter, verse 27. This gives us a date for the first advent of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Messiah. This prophecy is so explicit in its time calculation that unless one ignored this prophecy, one could not miss the coming of the Messiah. And we know that there were those in Israel at the time of Christ's uh, ministry, uh, there were those in Israel that were so expecting the Messiah that they literally met Mary and Joseph on the steps of the temple on the eighth day of Christ's birth, knowing that they would fulfill the law of Moses and that the child would be brought to the temple to be circumcised on the eighth day of his life. And I'm speaking specifically of Simeon. Now, Simeon was led by the Holy Spirit and was was warned by God that the Messiah would come to the temple. And he was there and met Mary and Joseph on the eighth day of Jesus' life when they came to the temple uh, for Jesus to be circumcised according to the law. Now, one could say that Simeon got a direct revelation from the Holy Spirit uh, a, a personal one-on-one -on -one communication with the Holy Spirit telling Simeon that this would happen. Or we could believe that Simeon just simply understood this prophecy. And he understood it so well, and he counted the days so well, counted the years so well, that he knew that the Messiah had come. And he went to the, to the temple to see the salvation of Israel. And he said, Mine eyes have seen the salvation of Israel. And that's what he said when he laid his eyes on the Christ child. How did Simeon know? Was it a direct revelation from the Holy Spirit, a one-on-one -on -one communication? Or did Simeon simply understand this prophecy. I suggest that Simeon understood this prophecy and the timeline so well that he knew the day and the hour of his visitation. Now, people may recoil from that and say, we're not to know the day or the hour. No, we are not to know the day and the hour of Christ's second advent. But this prophecy of Daniel predicts the coming of the Messiah. And this prophecy is specific to Jerusalem and the Jews, that is, Daniel's people. Now, before we get into the prophecy, I want to remind the listeners that what has become the orthodox teaching in the churches today is that the 70th week of this prophecy, the very last week of this prophecy, is somehow disconnected from the 69th week and tacked on to the very end of time, just before Christ's second advent. And that it doesn't discuss, the 70th week doesn't concern Christ's first advent. I hope this is clear. What is taught in the churches today, what has become the orthodox teaching of the churches today, 
is that the 70th or the final week of this 70-week prophecy does not concern Christ's first advent, but that it concerns Christ's second advent at the end of time. All of this prophecy, the first 69 weeks, they say, predicts, uh, has to do with a prophecy predicting the coming of Messiah, except the 70th week is detached. And there's a 2,000-year gap between the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel. Now, it sounds ridiculous, and it is. Daniel, in reality, was given to know the time of the, their first visitation, the coming of their Messiah, that which all the Psalms and all the prophets predicted, the coming of the Messiah, the first coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah to the Jews and Jerusalem. Now, before I continue, I'm going to, it's going to appear that I'm shifting gears, but I want to prepare you for the gross error that has resulted from this erroneous detachment of the 70th week of Daniel and interposing a 2,000-year gap or so, and then the 70th week of Daniel being fulfilled in the end of time. Those who teach that error are trying to disjoint this prophecy and confuse it and confound it. And the purpose of that is to eventually deny that the Christ has come and will not come until the last seven years, until the the end of time. It's trying to bring into question who is the Christ. Now remember, Jesus, when he was speaking to the apostles, or the disciples at the time, one of the disciples came to him and asked him the question, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus answered very strangely. Jesus answered that question very strangely. He said, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. That's how many times you should forgive your brother. And of course, nobody understood what he was saying. But this prophecy explains what Jesus was saying to the Jews. You are my brethren. I've been born in the house of Judah. I am the Messiah, the fulfillment of Daniel's 70-week prophecies. Seventy times, seven times, I will forgive my brethren. And if they do not receive me at the end of this 70 times, seven times, then I'll go to the Gentiles to be their Savior. And that's what happened in history. So you would have to ask the question, well, if Jesus came at the end of those 70 weeks, and used this prophecy to predict what would happen at the end of those 70 weeks that the Jews would reject him, and then that he, he would take the gospel to the Gentiles. What is all this talk about a future 70th week of Daniel? We've all been taught this. 
If you go to a Protestant church, you've, you've no doubt heard about a seven years of great tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel as though it's something to happen in the future. But the Scripture and history confirm. They agree that Jesus' ministry came in that 70th and final week of this prophecy. So once we go through this prophecy, and I show you that it was Jesus the Messiah who came during that 70th week, then you must ask yourself, what is all this talk about a future seven-year period of time? What is all this talk about the 70th week of Daniel being future? And I want to prepare you that I'm going to explain this prophecy given by Daniel so simply that no one will ever be able to confuse you again. You'll know the, the precise fulfillment of all 70 of these weeks predicted by Daniel. You will find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ at his first advent to the Jews. And you'll be left with no other question but to discover what is the purpose of all the churches talking about a future 70th week of Daniel. Now, I want to begin, uh, I would begin at the very beginning of this chapter, but it is such, Daniel is literally on his knees confessing the sins of Israel and his own sins. Daniel has discovered by reading the Bible, the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah, why and for how long the Jews would be in the Babylonian captivity. And God has opened his heart and his mind to the reason why God was punishing the Jews. And it was literally this, that the Jews had so mixed in the worship of Babylonian mysticism into their religion that God would not accept worship from them anymore. They had become apostate. They had mixed the holy with the profane. They had mixed the legitimate worship of God, which God ordained in the form of laws and ordinances, they had so mixed that perfect religion, those perfect observances that God ordained and established with Babylonianism or the worship of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz that no one could benefit from it. That through these Babylonish uh, uh, apostasies that they were practicing. In, in Ezekiel, it talks about uh, the, the women sitting on the steps of the temple. Excuse me, I apologize. Hang on a second. I felt my microphone. I, I apologize for that. I'll be more careful. That the women were sitting on the steps of the temple weeping for Tammuz. Okay, Tammuz was the Babylonian son of the Babylonian king Nimrod. He was believed to be divinely conceived in his mother, Semiramis, and that he was uh, the Christ. It was Babylonian sun worship. Why? You have to ask yourself, why did the Jews who were, who were led out of Egypt by, the, by God's very hand, why would they regard the religion of, and the cultic 
beliefs of the Babylonians? And why would they mix that with their religion on Temple Mount? Women sitting on the steps of the temple weeping for Tammuz, who allegedly was, was you know, gored by a boar and died. And they were simply weeping for the dead Tammuz. And there was also a, a, an image erected on the Temple Mount that provoked God to jealousy. What that image was is not described in the, in the Scriptures, but it had to be uh, an image of either Nimrod or Semiramis or Tammuz or some phallic symbol that God always condemned, the Jews always trying to mix with the perfect worship of God, trying to mix the perfect worship of God with Babylonianism. And also the men standing with their backs toward the temple, facing east, worshiping the rising sun. Babylonian worship of the sun god, Nimrod. And God wouldn't have it anymore. And literally, by his actions, God delivering them into Babylonian captivity was simply saying, if you wish to worship like the pagan heathen nations after I've delivered you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and spoke to you from the fiery summits of the mountain, and gave you my holy law, and gave you my covenant, and gave you a nation, and a temple, and the perfect, pristine worship. If you take that and reject that and seek to worship like the Babylonians then did, to Babylon you will go. Daniel understood this. Daniel understood the sins of his people. He understood his own sin. Repentance had been granted to, to Daniel. And he was on his knees repenting. And because of his contrite heart, his acknowledgement of the sin of Israel, God had a man that he could work with. And he chose Daniel, and he was gracious to him. And so he gave him a timeline. They could rest assured that after this 70 weeks, that their Messiah would come, their Savior would come, that they would fulfill their time in Babylon, and when the, the order came down to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, would be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Then Messiah would come. And he did right on time at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. And the first part of this chapter is the most emotional private confessions of Daniel. And it's so moving that I can hardly read it without becoming emotional myself. And this show isn't about me. It isn't about my emotions. So I'm going to skip Daniel's confession, and you can read it yourself. And just know that this prayer that Daniel prays, this confession that Daniel prays, is the prayer that each and every one of us should pray because we are guilty of the same sins of Israel. We have mixed the holy with the profane. Babylonian worship. Now, in another broadcast sometime, I'll delineate all of those Babylonish sins that we've mixed with the holy, pristine 
worship of God. But that's not the purpose for this, this discussion today. We're going to talk about the prophecy with which God rewarded Daniel for getting on his knees and confessing not only his sins, but the sins of his entire nation. The mixing of the holy with the profane. Daniel wanted to return to the pristine worship of God Almighty. He knew why he was in Babylonian captivity, because his people had mixed Babylonian worship with the pristine worship of God. So here is how God rewarded such a contrite heart, beginning in verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. This is an angel of the Lord who has been sent by God just as soon as Daniel's supplications reached the throne of God in prayer. God ordered the angel of the Lord to come and instruct Daniel what the future of Israel would be and the coming of the Messiah. And the angel begins by saying, at the beginning of thy supplications. See, God already knew what was on Daniel's heart. And at the very beginning of Daniel's supplications, his prayer before the throne of God confessing his sins, God gave forth the commandment for that angel to come forth and to show Daniel, who was greatly beloved of the Lord, to understand a specific matter. And that was the coming of their Messiah. And verse 24 begins the prophecy. This is what the churches of today have confused us with. Let us read it the way God wrote it and believe it the way God wrote it and believe it the way it was fulfilled in history. He says 70 weeks. Now, everybody understands, before I even continue, everybody understands, nobody is in dispute that these 70 weeks referred to here are 70 seven-year periods of time. And this is exactly what Jesus was referring to when asked by the disciples, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven times. That's how many times I'm going to forgive you. But there's going to come a time that I cannot forgive you anymore. The Bible says, if you believe that, if you do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Jesus was proclaiming himself to be the Messiah. He was proclaiming himself to be the fulfillment of the 70 times 7. And so we begin again in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, speaking of those 70 weeks of years, those 70 times sevens. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Okay? In other words, God has set a calendar a predetermined calendar, 70 weeks, 490 years. Seven times 70 equals 490. 490 years, a 490-year period of time. He says 70 weeks are determined, set aside on God's calendar, upon thy people. Speaking of Daniel's people, who were they? The Jews. And upon thy holy city. What was their holy city? Jerusalem. So the prophecy specifically applies to the Jews and to Jerusalem. Now look, if if you're talking about a future 70th week of Daniel, it has to apply only to the Jews and only to Jerusalem, doesn't it? 
more questions to ask about what has become the orthodox teaching in the churches today, that the 70th week of Daniel didn't happen 2,000 years ago, but that God interposed a 2,000-year period of, they call it the church age, before the fulfillment of this 70th week of Daniel that is detached by 2,000 years. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, Israel, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All of this is to happen in this 490-year period of time. All of this is to happen in these 70 weeks of years, these 70 times 7 period of time, 490 years. You have to ask yourself, how do they take the 70th week and tack it on the end? doesn't make sense to this prophecy. Well, the question someone would ask, well, if it happened 2,000 years ago, what brought an end to the transgression? What was the transgression? The transgression was the thought that through the shedding of the blood of lambs and goats, sins were forgiven. The Bible clearly says the blood of lambs and goats cannot for, cannot wash away sins. Only the blood of the Messiah can wash away our sins. And all the sacrificial ceremony, all the sacrificial lambs that were slain on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem at the temple were only typifications of what Jesus would, in fact, accomplish during those 490 years. That was the transgression. God said, your sacrifices are a stench in my nostrils. Now we have to ask the question, how did the blood of lambs and goats become a stench in God's nostrils when he's the one that ordered them to be done? Because the Jews simply didn't understand what they typified. They thought, they began to think that there was actually remission of sins by the shedding of the blood of animals. You have to hearken back to the days, the very first days of this creation, when Adam and Eve sinned and did that which God forbid them to do. They sinned and they tried to cover their nakedness with their own self-fashioned aprons trying to cover their sins by, the, by their own efforts. And clearly the Scripture indicates that that was insufficient because Jesus clothed them with coats of skins. Did you ever stop to ask yourself where Jesus got those skins? Did he just get them out of his hind pocket? Or did he make a blood sacrifice of a lamb for Adam and Eve? You see, the sacrificial system was instituted in the Garden of Eden. That until Christ the Messiah, the Lamb of God, comes, you bring animal sacrifices, shed the blood of innocent animals, because the perfect Lamb, when he comes, he will be spotless and without blemish, and he will shed his blood for the remission of your sins. Every time you sacrifice a lamb, you look forward to the coming of the perfect lamb, Christ the Messiah. You know, you hear the theologians today talk about the age of grace, that the age of grace began when Jesus was crucified. When did the age of grace happen? Was there anyone in all of world's history that was not saved but by the grace of Almighty God and the shedding of the blood of Christ. Just as we, in our generation, look back 
to Christ's sacrifice. Adam and Eve and all the generations prior to Christ looked forward to Christ through animal sacrifices. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And until he came and fulfilled this prophecy, they had nothing but animal sacrifices, but they could not wash away sins. So what was the transgression of Israel? What, what transgression was God going to bring to an end with the coming of the Messiah? The belief that the blood of lambs and goats could take away sin. When that which is perfect is come, that which is temporary is done away with. Right here is the prediction of the end of animal sacrifices. Seventy weeks, 490 years, 70 times, seven times, are determined upon thy people, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. That's where the Messiah is going to come to the Jews in Jerusalem to finish the transgression. In other words, to perform the perfect sacrifice and to do away with that which is imperfect animal sacrifices. And it says, and to make an end of sins. To make an end of sins? Is that what Jesus did? Absolutely. If we are washed in his blood, we are perfect. We will be clothed in white linen to make an end of sins. We don't make any more animal sacrifices. We don't make any sacrifices at all because we acknowledge that Jesus was the only, the only sacrifice that could take away our sins. And if he took away our sins, they are gone. That's how you put an end of sins. A perfect sacrifice. And then if our sins are gone, are we not reconciled to God? It says, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. The scripture plainly says that he reconciled us to God. He became sin for us. And now we have peace with the Father. We are one with him, fully reconciled. And then it goes on to say, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All of these happened. All of these things happened during Christ's ministry. To seal up the vision and the prophecy. In other words, by the end of this 490-year period, this prophecy will be sealed up. Now, what, what, what is this referring to? When you finish reading a scroll, what do you do? You do just like Jesus did when he read from the Scriptures. You roll it up and you seal it. It's done. In 490 years, this prophecy will be rolled up and sealed. But that's not what they teach in the churches. No, the seal is still broken. The 490 years is, is not over, but we've got one seven-year period of time that we're going to tack on the end of time. What is taught in the churches today literally means, no, this prophecy and this vision is not sealed up. Now, who would say that if they were not a deceiver? Four hundred and ninety years, seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That's the Jews, that's Jerusalem to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, praise his holy name, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy. 
I'm sorry, you people like me who once believed in futurism are in error, grievous error. An error which has, has, which has so much consequences that it would take a month to describe them. And if you'll give me a month, I'll describe them. But that vision was fulfilled, was sealed up 2,000 years ago. Nobody can break the seal on this. Nobody can take off one of those 70 weeks and tack it on the end of time. No matter how crafty or how eloquent he is, no matter how, how many explanations, no matter how many proofs he can give you that this 70 weeks is tacked on the end, this Bible says to seal up the vision and the prophecy. And it ends by saying, and to anoint the most holy. Who is the most holy? Is it not Christ? To anoint the most holy. When was, when was Christ anointed? And by whom? The scripture plainly says that John was baptizing in the river. And Jesus, the Messiah, came to him to be baptized according to the law. And John says, it is me who should be baptized of thee. And Jesus said, just do it. And he was anointed, not just by water, but by the Holy Spirit that descended on him like a dove, and even the Father's voice was heard in heaven. This is my beloved Son, the Messiah. It was the 70th week of Daniel. And he began his ministry, his seven-year period of ministry, in the, on the banks of the Jordan River, being baptized by John the Baptist and according to the law. And at that point, John says, he must increase and I must decrease. The anointing fell on Jesus because he was going to give up his life in the 70th week, in the middle of the 70th week of Daniel, to say that that 70th week of Daniel is tacked on the end is to say that Messiah has not come. Messiah has not come. We are yet in our sins. Transgressions are not finished. Our sins are not at an end. We are not yet reconciled to God. Everlasting righteousness has not yet been brought in. The vision is not sealed up, nor the prophecy. And the Messiah has not been yet anointed. Is that what we believe? Well, that's what you must believe if you're a futurist, that the 70th week of Daniel has not yet been fulfilled, and it won't be fulfilled until the, the end of time. How ridiculous what they've taught us in the churches. Now, he says in verse 25, he's speaking, the angel is speaking to Daniel. He's being rewarded for his penitent heart. The angel says to Daniel, know therefore and understand. Don't be confused. Don't listen to any futurist. Don't listen to anybody else. I'm the angel of the Lord. I've been sent by God Almighty to teach you. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore, to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. What's this prophecy all about? The coming of the Messiah. The first coming of Messiah. When did he come? Anybody? 2,000 years ago, didn't he? That's what you believe, isn't it? 
that the Messiah came 2,000 years ago, thereabouts. What is all the talk about a future 70 weeks of Daniel? It's future 70th week of Daniel. Confusing, isn't it? Who has tried to confuse God's people? And for what purpose? The angel again says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. All right, what's seven and 62? Anybody? It's 69, isn't it? 69 weeks of years. You see, already the angel is dividing up those 70 periods of seven years, 490 years, breaking it up into three segments. First, seven years or 49, seven weeks or 49 years, 70 or seven times seven is 49, right? And then after that, there will be a 62-week period of time. Together, they make 69 weeks, right? But the prophecy is about 70 weeks. So we have, they, we have to have another seven-year period of time, don't we? And why does he divide these 70 weeks into three distinct periods? Because the progression till the rebuilding of Jerusalem and till the coming of the, of the prince, Messiah, indicates that he will come in the 70th, the final week. You see, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, remember Jerusalem was destroyed when the Babylonians came and took them all captive as slaves into Babylon, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus Christ, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, or 69 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. So the first seven-week uh, seven period of time and the 62-week period of time will be dedicated to rebuilding Jerusalem, the street, and the wall of Jerusalem. What about the Messiah? Well, just remember, there's one week left to go, right? 69 weeks doesn't equal 70 weeks. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks is 69 weeks, not 70 weeks. It says, and after three score and two weeks, now remember, first there were seven weeks or 49 years, then immediately following the seventh week of years begins a countdown of 62 periods of seven years. Was there any separation between the, the, the seventh week and the eighth week beginning that 62-week period of time? No. So why should we let anybody tell us that there's a, a separation between the 69th and the 70th week? It doesn't make sense, does it? That's because it isn't, doesn't. It, there is no sense in it. First, there were seven weeks, then there were 62 weeks, then there was one week. Thus fulfilling the prophecy for the Jews and Jerusalem. The eighth week immediately follows the seventh week. There's no 2,000-year gap in there or any gap of any kind. And the 70th week immediately follows the 69th week, the 69th week, and there's no gap in there either, Chuck Missler. There's no gap. Or Messiah hasn't come. Messiah the Prince has not come. Isn't that what they're really trying to teach us with this future 70th week of Daniel? The Messiah has not yet come? And if Messiah has not yet come, 
who are they fixing to tell us is the Messiah in this future 70th week of Daniel? You better believe they are deceiving us like nobody's business. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be first seven weeks, and then three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. It's all talking about Jerusalem, isn't it? The street and the wall, nothing about the Messiah. You have to know he's coming during the 70th week. After the 69th week, because seven weeks and 62 weeks, dealing with the wall and the street and Jerusalem is 69 weeks, isn't it? Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 says, And after the three score and two weeks, that means after the 69th week, that means at the beginning of the 70th week shall Messiah be cut off. That is, killed. Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, for you and me. The perfect lamb, the substitute, the propitiation for our sins. During the 70th week, after the 60 and 2 weeks, understanding that before the 62 weeks, there were already seven weeks of years transpired. So we're really talking about after the 69th week, because 62 and 7 equals 69. I mean, this is really first grade math. All you have to do is add 7 and 62 you get 69. And it says, after the three score and two weeks, which literally means after the 69th week, which literally means during the 70th week, shall Messiah be cut off. Messiah shall be cut off. He'll be killed. But not for himself. And the people of the princess shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So after this 70th week, Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed by the people of the prince that shall come. Who was the prince that came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary? Prince Titus. He was the son of the current Caesar at the time, Vespasian. He came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Why would God predict and then allow the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, the temple, to be destroyed? Not one stone remaining upon the other because they rejected. The Jews and Jerusalem rejected their Messiah. They knew not the time of their visitation. They didn't, unlike Simeon, they didn't understand the time of their visitation. Had they understood this prophecy, and had they kept the calendar like God was, was keeping the calendar, and performing his timeline to perfection, they would have been waiting at the steps of the temple with Simeon for their Messiah. But they didn't understand this prophecy, and they rejected Christ as their Messiah. And after they rejected Jesus, you know they wanted desperately to return to animal sacrifices because they had every hope in the blood of lambs and goats to propitiate their sins 
and reconcile them to God. When God said that the blood of blood, their sacrifices were a stench in his nostrils, they would rather return to animal sacrifices than to accept Jesus as their once and for all lamb, the one that was slain from the foundation of the world in the Garden of Eden to propitiate the sins of Adam and Eve when God clothed them with coats of skins, skins that resulted from the shedding of blood. Daniel is just comprehending that the Messiah is going to come to Jerusalem to Daniel's people, the Jews, and then the city and the sanctuary are going to be destroyed. And he said, The end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Desolations. What did Jesus say? He said, Your house. Now, prior to this, he called it my father's house. You have made my father's house a den of thieves. Right? But what did he say before he was crucified? He said, your house, not my father's house, your house is left unto you desolate. Why? Because they rejected their lamb. They were going to reject their lamb. The temple was only needed for the blood of the sacrifice to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. Once Jesus' blood was shed, there was no more need for a temple. There was absolutely no more need for a sacrifice. Once the perfect lamb was slain and his blood shed and became the atonement for sins, To make any further sacrifice would be simply a demonstration of a rejection of the efficacy of Christ's blood. You know what? The whole Christian world today wants the Jews to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again. Do you suppose that has anything to do with the future 70th week of Daniel? What sacrifice of animals, lambs, and goats would God recognize after his son shed his own blood on that mountain? You've got to be kidding me. But that's what our churches are teaching us. Oh, we've got to pray for the Jews. We've got to take up collection for the Jews. We've got to help finance the Aliyah of the Jews back to their ancient homeland so they can build a temple, so that they can make animal sacrifices and eat and drink damnation to themselves. Once again, rejecting the perfect Lamb of God that came during the 70th week, 2,000 years ago. Do you know what the purpose of this future 70th week of Daniel is? To once and for all, not only physically, but to spiritually destroy the Jews. Because if they don't accept the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, the lamb that came at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, after the 62 weeks, they are yet in their sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And isn't that what the world wants? There's only one hope for the Jews. The same hope that we all have is to believe in that one that whose blood was shed on that mountain 2,000 years ago. 
And you better watch out, because if you believe in anything significant from God going to happen in a future seven years period of time, you're going to be deceived. You're going to be offered another Christ and not the one that was offered for you 2,000 years ago. He says in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks, after 62 weeks, a score is 20, three score is 60, plus two, that's 62 weeks, remembering that those 62 weeks could only come after the first seven weeks. So altogether you have 69 weeks, and it says, and after the 69 weeks, that's during the 70th week, Messiah will come, and he will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come, Prince Titus and the Roman 10th Legion, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof will be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. That's just exactly how it fulfilled in history. Perfectly, just exactly the way the angel of the Lord gave it to Daniel. It happened just exactly the way God prophesied it to Daniel through that angel, the way that history and the Gospels record it. There's no mystery of this. There's no future 70th week of Daniel. It is finished. And the scroll is rolled up. The vision and the prophecy have been fulfilled. The scroll is rolled up, and it is sealed And anybody who opens that sealed scroll on this prophecy and tries to change it in any way stands under the judgment of Almighty God. When the king puts his seal on a scroll, no one else is authorized to open it. And you can tell that to your futurist Protestant pastor. And tell him Tom sent you. Now, what did Jesus do during that 70th week of Daniel? Daniel 9, verse 27, the end of the prophecy. And he, the Messiah, the one this prophecy is all about, Jesus, in the 70th week of Daniel, and Jesus shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. What covenant? The covenant in his blood. He'll confirm that covenant. How do you confirm a covenant? By fulfilling it. The 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 Psalms and the prophets predicted the coming of Messiah, that he would redeem mankind to God by his own blood. That's the covenant. The previous covenants, God's people break. But the covenant of Jesus' blood is an unconditional covenant. There's no attachments to it. There's no addendums to it future or otherwise. He confirmed that covenant during the 70th week when he hung on that cross and said, it is finished. His blood had been drained. He had redeemed us to God. That's how you confirm a covenant. You just fulfill it and sign it with your own blood. That's what Jesus did. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, a seven-year period of time. Remember, we've been talking about seven weeks and 62 weeks for Jerusalem, the street, the wall, but there's one week left to go. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There you go. One week, the 70th week. Look, the 490 years is broken into three segments. Seven weeks of years, 62 weeks of years, 
and one week of years. You can't get this wrong unless you're a futurist, unless you go to an apostate Protestant church. How could God, how, how could man have confused us about a prophecy so simple? He confirmed the covenant with many for one week. That was from the time he was anointed, the most holy was anointed, in the River Jordan three and a half years later. Nobody disputes this. It was three and a half years after his baptism, his anointing, that he gave up his life. What about the last three and a half years? Well, they've been told, well, we can explain that. It's a, you're either a pre-tribber or a mid-tribber or a post-tribber, you futurists who don't believe yet that the Messiah has come, that Jesus wasn't the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. That doesn't come for another 2,000 years. You see what they're doing? You see what these liars, these wolves in sheep's clothing behind the the pulpits of the churches today, you see what they're teaching you? The scriptures are much easier to read than all the gobbledygook that's coming from the pulpit of the churches today. First there were seven weeks, then 62 weeks, then Messiah came. In the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. How did he do that? By giving up his own life. He caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life. He was the sacrifice in the midst of the week. He shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. If Daniel got this message from God Almighty, what do you think God would think if the Jews sewed the veil of the temple back together having rejected Jesus Christ and his propitiation during the 70th week of Daniel and, and started doing animal sacrifices all over again? They aren't sacrifices. God doesn't re regard them. He didn't regard them before because they were supposed to prepare Israel to receive their lamb. Instead, they got to thinking that the, lamb, the blood of lambs and goats were... Uh, Washed away their sins when nothing of that, it, nothing, nothing doing, nothing doing. Jesus did it, and once he did it, to return to animal sacrifices is simply a demonstration of your rejection of Christ, who in the midst of the week, the week, the 70th week. You know, you, can't, you can only have it three ways, either seven weeks, 62 weeks, or the week. Thus, the 70th week is the week. In the midst of the week, three and a half years, that's the middle of the 70th week, Three and a half years after his baptism, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. How? By fulfilling all the prophecies about his ministry, which was to die for our sins. So what about the remaining three and a half years? Yes, through the Spirit of God, through the Spirit of Jesus, the apostles continued to confirm the covenant, the blood covenant, the covenant in Christ's blood for a remaining three and a half years to the leaders of the Jewish nation. And Stephen, three and a half years after Christ's crucifixion, was pleading with the Sanhedrin, pleading with the Sanhedrin, proclaiming that Jesus was their lamb, Jesus was their 70th week, Jesus was their Messiah, and he finally got it through their heads. 
that they had wickedly slain their own Messiah. And how do we know that they comprehended what Stephen was saying? Because they rent their clothes. Can you imagine the horror that came over the Sanhedrin when, they, when Stephen finally convinced them through the leading and teaching and conviction of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the one they wickedly slew, finally convinced them and spoke to the marrow of their bones that they had slain their own Messiah in fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. That because of their rejection of the Lamb, the city and the sanctuary would be destroyed. They rent their clothes. Now you would think at that time, when they were thoroughly convinced that Stephen was right, that Jesus really was their Messiah, you'd think they would, they would fall on their knees on the steps of the Sanhedrin and repent of that wickedness. and receive their Messiah. But they didn't. They stoned Stephen to shut him up. That was the last straw. I've forgiven my brother 70 times, seven times, and you've rejected me. After the witness of the Holy Spirit, my Holy Spirit, who remains among you, Stephen, filled with my spirit, finally convinced you that you've slain your own Messiah. And what do you do? You kill the prophets, just like you have for all the years that I've dealt with you. I've forgiven you 70 times 7. Now it's over. The gospel of the kingdom shall go to the Gentiles. That's the way it happened. That's the way it was prophesied to happen. That's the way it happened in history. So what is all this cockamamie talk about a future 70th week of Daniel? To get you to do as did the Jews, to reject Jesus as the fulfillment of that 70th week and to propose to you another Messiah. And if you believe in futurism, If you believe that that 70th week of Daniel is yet to come, you stand on the precipice of accepting the wrong Messiah. A counterfeit. If you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel, like your wolf in sheep's clothing behind your pulpit has been teaching you for all your life, he's prepared you to receive a false Messiah. What do you think about that? You don't need a fancy theologian to tell you what this prophecy prophesies. You can simply read it yourself A third grader could read this prophecy and see its fulfillment all 70 weeks fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Now you have to ask yourself, why are they teaching me about a future 70th week of Daniel? A future seven years of great tribulation? And if you leave that question unanswered, you leave yourself in a position yet to be deceived. This is the most important subject that a man can discuss today. There's no other subject under the sun that has greater consequences for God's people than Daniel's 70-week prophecy. Because the Jews didn't understand this prophecy, they knew not the time of their visitation. 
because the Christians don't understand this prophecy, they're going to accept a different Messiah. You see the consequences that this prophecy had for the Jews who did not know about the 70th week of Daniel? Imagine what the consequences will be for Christians who believe in a future 70th week of Daniel. I think I'm going to leave this right where it is and let God's people pray and read this prophecy over and over and over until it is clear, crystal clear in your mind. That's all I have, Michael. Thank you, Tom. I just want to add one more thing. And I, first of all, I want to thank you for asking the important questions as you were sharing the message. Uh, there really is no need to ask any questions. Thank you, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, but I do want to point out something, folks. Uh, there are many of the newer translations that have taken out the word Messiah out of 925 and 926. And I want to give you a list of some of those newer translations that literally have taken out the name of the Messiah from this prophecy. And that would start with the, the ISV, the NIV, uh, the New Living Translation, English Standard Version, Net Bible, God's Word Translation, Jubilee, Bible 2000, uh, the English Revised Translation, the World English Bible, and many others. This is why it's so important to do some comparison study of all these different Bibles, which you can do as a really simple source called BibleHub.com. You literally can go there anytime Compare a verse at the Bible, and you'll see what the King James says and what all these other Bibles will say. And you're going to have a starting revelation that they, these men, who are supposed to be acting on behalf of God, have literally taken out the Messiah. So how would you, so many of these people are reading even this, these inaccurate, false Bibles. They're just so twisted that they don't even didn't realize who they're reading or who they're reading about. So, But I thank you very much, Tom. Um, I thank you very, very much. Um, we have a couple more minutes. If anybody has any questions, I personally don't. I personally, uh, you asked the questions I was going to ask, so I don't know where to go from here, except that it was a phenomenal, God-inspired message. And for those... If you have any doubts or confusions, I strongly recommend you download this show. You listen to it over and over again and challenge challenge it. Try to disprove what Tom has said is wrong. And you're going to come to the same conclusion I did, that he's actually speaking the truth here. And uh, I don't know if, York, do you have anything to say? Well, I was listening here and... When he started, my jaw dropped, and now it's uh, somewhere on the ground. I knew this lecture that he was giving because I was listening to the earlier broadcast that you mentioned in the beginning of this broadcast. And uh, I have to say that falls into nothing compared to what Tom did today. Um, when you wrote in the, in the chat box, uh, if anyone has questions, please text them in the chat room. I just thought, well... Every time that I have a question, Tom answers it right before me here, before he can even ask the question. Um, I absolutely agree with both of you, and I cannot emphasize enough how important this Daniel 70 is week is to understand the whole Bible, the Bible in its completion. And I will not only ask the listeners that are here right now and that are downloading or listening later on to listen for themselves, 
but to try to spread this sermon that Tom Fress just gave us. And that was absolutely, in my opinion, led by the Holy Spirit, the way that he did it, to spread this to all your families, to all your friends that you know that have some purpose in that. And even though to people who don't have some purpose in that, to turn them to Christ and to let them see why the world is acting today the way it does. Because the whole new world order is nothing else than just trying to set up the so-called third Jewish temple in Jerusalem. This is absolutely the futurist agenda that was founded by Alcazar and Ribera in the 1590s as a message of the counter-reformation to take the eyes of the Pope of Rome, the historical, biblical, and prophetic Antichrist as identified by all the Protestant movers like Calvin, Huss, Cranmer, Luther. I can count them all here, but you get the message. They were not deceived by this. They knew about the 70th week of Daniel. And that's why afterwards the Roman Catholic Church started its Council of Trent. And if you don't know the Council of Trent, just Google it and study it. This 18-year-old, uh, this 18-year-long um, coming together that they had to counter the Reformation, to counter for the first time in that time, 1600 years, when people were able to read the Word of God in their own language, in the vulgar tongue, as it is called. That is your own language, because up to then, the Bible was only read in Latin in the sermons of the Roman Catholic priests, and nobody understood Latin. So it was all interpretation. And don't be deceived by any man like in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 it is said. Um, don't listen to man. Listen to the word of God. And uh, I too want to thank Tom to uh, accept the invitation and to share this wonderful sermon with us here tonight. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to part two because he will come back and explain even in the deeper the whole Daniel 9 uh, Daniel chapter 9 prophecy uh, even though that I think that up to this point there are not many questions open no, um, I think it's pretty it's pretty well it's been explained if anyone wants to understand Daniel 9 uh, verses 23 through 27 just listen to this episode you should be fine <laughs> but what we could do though is tie in now the next time is the Antichrist agenda the future is a 70th 7th future is 70th week as far as how and who is perpetuating it, it, this false story, twisting the Bible, and who's behind it all. That would certainly be a uh, a good tie-in. You know, the the other side of the coin, if you will, the fu- counterfeit 70th week. That should be a, a good second part. You yeah, know, a, but isn't it uh, isn't it quite a funny when you when you listen uh, when you when you listen and when you read the Word of God? how easy to understand that is, that even, like Tom said, this is basic mathematics, uh, seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week make 70 weeks. This is basic. And isn't it funny then to see how um, different the teaching of man is that is so complicated that they will put all the people just putting more question marks on them than they ever had, just because they do not read the Word of God anymore. And they, Anna, love, they love to listen to men instead of listening to God, and men is just deceiving them with complicated things. You know, all these people with doctor's degrees and professors and have studied so many years here and so many years that, oh, then I can believe. But the Word of God, how, how long has God been sitting in the university? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it's a fine example of Jesuit casuistry and, and sophistry and NLP, neuro linguistic programming, and you know, ultimately, you come to the realization that this whole this whole futuristic nonsense is a distraction to keep people from the, their eyes on who the Antichrist is. Yeah, the people just believe <laughs> things that are more complicated than the things that are easy. And the Bible in itself is easy. 
You just have to open your mind and open your heart and let the Spirit in when you read it. And when you don't understand it, then ask the Holy Spirit for, for, for help in understanding it, and he will come to you, and, and you will understand it. Like Tom just very made, uh, made it very clear in the reading that, that he just did here. It, it was, uh, and I, I mean, really, I, I said here with my jaw dropped to the ground because I said this is, this is impossible for anyone who has two brain cells not to understand this sermon. And, and, and as I pointed out too, I hope you folks realize you do have to have the right Bible. You do have to have the right Bible, <laughs> and, that is, and, and that is that is the reason why there are so many websites out there that try to bash King James only Christians. Oh yeah. I mean, we can we can make a discussion. What about the Geneva Bible of 1599? But you have to bear in mind that both Bibles have had at least, at least the Geneva Bible has had at least 70% of the known textus receptus of the original Hebrew and original Greek writings as their basis. So w when you don't read the King James, I can advise you then to read uh, the Geneva Bible, but for the rest, the King James is the Word of God. He preserved the Word for us, and that is why it is attacked on every way possible. Absolutely. Um, this, this, this is, to me, as far as I understand, because, you know, English is not my native language, but uh, this is, I, I mean, when I read the King James and I put my German Lutheran Bible next to it, I discover mistake after mistake after mistake that they did in the 1984 version of, um, of the Lutheran Bible. And that's the best Bible that I could get from Luther, because the other one is written in old German, and I went, neither can I read this handwriting that it's done this because it's old German letters for the first, and the second is the German was uh, quite different 400 years ago than it is today. So um, the, the King James Bible is the reference, and that is why it is attacked on so many places. So when somebody attacks the King James Bible and saying, well, oh, King James was the papers, and he was a homosexual, and what do I not know what they all say about him? And you have to ask yourself, what is the agenda behind this? Because the Bible has been discredited for almost 2,000 years. Rome in the Dark Ages persecuted anybody who had a Bible that came not out of the Roman Catholic Church. And even when you own one that came out of the Roman Catholic Church, I guess you have been persecuted because you were not allowed to have this. People were slain, people were burned alive, people were slain, people were hung, people were crucified because they were seeking the word of God. And the big disappointment of today's time is that we live in a time where they do so many distractions that people are not even seeking the word of God anymore. Right. And when they seek it, they, they just grab the next Bible that lays to them and have no idea that then they will read a corrupted Bible. And because it is corrupted, they don't understand it. And then the Bible doesn't make any sense. And then you lose your faith. And that's exactly what they want. Very good point. Uh, gentlemen, I think we should end the show now. Uh, I think because I, I really want people to stay focused on what Tom had to say. I think you and I you already had our chance to say a little bit. I think we both added a little. But the important thing in this message was to understand Daniel uh, chapter uh, 9, verses uh, 23 through 27. And Tom has done, through the grace of God and his mercy and his spirit, uh, a, a masterful presentation. And there's no reason anybody that listens to this show should go away confused now about this message. And um, I also like to say that, you know, in a, about a half an hour, we're going to have another show. I'd like to invite Tom and anybody else who'd like to stay or join. Uh, York and I are going to be doing a show on Plato's Cave. And I think that that should be really relevant and understanding what a lot of us are going through this, these days as far as, uh, you know, coming out of the, you know, and standing for the truth. So, and... Uh, and following Christ instead of the, the herd, if you will. And uh, we can talk more about that. But, uh, Tom, do you have any closing comments before we end the show? Yes, I do have a closing comment. Okay. What I've given the people today is a realization 
of the consequences that befell the Jews and Jerusalem for not understanding Daniel's 70-week prophecy. They knew not the time of their visitation. They knew not that Jesus came right on time, their Messiah. They missed him. They crucified him. And Jerusalem and the Jews were destroyed. Now, comprehending that, failure to understand Daniel's prophecy, they knew not the time of their visitation, when Christ, their Messiah, would come. Look at those consequences and what it has resulted for the Jews throughout the last 2,000 years. Now, comprehending that, what are the consequences for Christians today for not understanding this prophecy? If you'll invite me back, I will delineate for you exactly what those consequences are for us repeating the sin of Israel and not understanding this prophecy. Well, you know I'm going to invite you back for that. You absolutely know that. So that's, well, there we go. we got a second part to this series. So. Okay, blessings in the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, York. And uh, it's okay. I'm going to end the recording here. Uh, those who have joined us, thank you. If you want to come back in a half an hour, we have another show, and uh, I think you'll get a lot out of that, too. It's not as important as this show, but it's still an important show. <laughs> so, um, but, okay, folks. God bless.